Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, Sabina Saving, who's going to talk about ANO safety screening. Uh, and Sabine, Sabina is from Hoffman La Roche. So, good morning. And first of all, I would also like to uh, thank the organizers. Um, and I, I really like this venue, and I think it's a beautiful city here. So, my talk will focus on, on the safety of antisense oligonucleotides, and I will specifically address some uh, in vitro assays that are able to early on capture toxicity risks. And let me start with a classical screening cascade for antisense oligonucleotide drugs that is applied, and we heard about that already a little bit in the morning. So there are, is nearly an infinite number of possible candidates you can choose among when you start in, with a new target. And, um, in silico design, algorithms help us a lot in, in narrowing that number down, and the most uh, or best predicted sequences are going to be synthesized, and then they are um, tested for their efficacy, for the uh, knockdown of the intended target in in vitro systems. And the next step is already going into animal models and testing for efficacy and for safety in order to finally come up with a clinical candidate. So in this slide, um, I show you that um, the, the safety that we face with is, pretty, is, is very nicely mirrored by the tissue distribution of the antisense oligonucleotides after um, systemic delivery. And we have seen this uh, tissue distribution in form of the whole body autoradiograph already in the last um, talk. And you have highest accumulation of these molecules in the kidney and you see a lot in the liver, and then you have uh, also something in the spleen and, and little in other tissues. And the toxicity that we see with oligonucleotides after two week in vivo studies in mice or rats are uh, pretty much for the liver that we have increases in liver enzymes like ALT or AST. And um, if we look histo with histopathology methods, we see that we have uh, necrosis and apoptosis in the liver and we have necrosis in the kidney cells. And we, we also see when we, do, when we do this in vivo safety testing that we have a pretty high attrition rate, which is sometimes about or even above 50%, which means we have to use a very high number of animal models. And still then, we only have rodent data. We have no idea at that moment how that translates into the human. And that makes us uh, wish to, to identify in vitro assays that early on can uh, detect safety liabilities of that compounds. And um, in order to identify these in vitro assays, we, we applied the strategy to put together a set of reference oligonucleotides with very well described in vivo toxicity and tested those, the effect of those molecules in in vitro systems. And we focus here on hepatocytes and on kidney cells for the given reasons I showed you, and uh, looked if we can come up with predictive assays using both rodent cells as well as human cells in order to touch on the trans uh, translatability aspect. And also, we felt like this system may also help us in, in identifying mechanism of actions um, of the toxicity. So we further on didn't want to deliver the, um, LN, uh, the, the oligonucleotides uh, with uh, transfection reagents or particles, but we wanted to do to be as similar as possible to, to what happens in vivo. So we um, applied the oligonucleotides just with any um, uh, assistance. So it's so the so-called somnotic uptake to capture both hybridization-dependent nuclear effects as well as aptameric effects. And um, here I show you, first of all, the first uh, tool set that we started with when we were looking at hepatotoxicity. We selected seven different uh, oligonucleotides. These were LNA gut mares directed against one target, which is MIDI-88. And I think you can see we had three safe molecules that didn't raise any ALT in a two-week mouse study, while uh, on the other hand we have four very toxic hepatotoxic molecules that showed uh, a dramatic increase in ALT levels. And we, oops, we tested them first just in a regular cell line because it's the uh, easiest tool uh, for, for handling. And we used 3T3 fibroblast and uh, HEPG2 cells. And we treated the cells for up to seven days with retreatment after three days. And then we looked for cytotoxicity in the cells. And as you can see here, depicted by ATP levels in the cells, we didn't see any effect of the toxic 
oligonucleotides. Uh, but when we looked at the knockdown or the pharmacological effect uh, of the molecules in the cells, we also saw hardly any knockdown of the target, indicating that under the unassisted uptake uh, conditions, we don't reach the productive compartment um, with the oligonucleotides. So we went further on and wanted to be a little bit closer to the in vivo situation and looked into freshly isolated primary um, mouse hepatocytes. And we tested again the same set and uh, we started now with looking into the knockdown capability to see if these cells take um, the oligonucleotides up. And you see that we, for all the molecules we investigated, we have knocked down, certainly to a various extent. But it's important to note here that the knockdown efficacy doesn't go in parallel with the toxic effects in the liver. And uh, so we uh, did a next experiment where we looked for toxicity in the freshly isolated mouse hepatocytes and looked initially for LEH levels and then subsequently for ATP levels. Both are cytotox readouts and we, uh, I think you can easily see that we don't have any, any effect on LEA secretion or ATP reduction with the safe molecules, whereas the in vivo toxic oligonucleotides showed a dose-dependent increase in LDH and the supernatant of the cell cultures and uh, a dose-dependent decrease in intracellular ATP levels. So we were very happy that we had some signatures of toxic uh, oligonucleotides, but certainly we only have seven here and we have only one target. So we extended that uh, tool set of uh, oligonucleotides. So we tested finally 34 different oligonucleotides. And I summarized that here. They were against different targets and I had ordered them to the severity of in vivo um, toxicity. So you see on the left hand, the white boxes are the safe ones and the very red ones are the dramatic uh, toxic ones, and below you see um, the same results from the in vitro assay, LDH changes and ATP changes, and uh, with the same color code applied, and I think you can appreciate that uh, the color pattern goes in parallel, so the in vitro uh, safe ones uh, are also the in vivo safe ones, and vice versa for the toxic ones. We certainly don't predict 100%, so in this case we were able to properly predict 32 out of the 34 um, oligonucleotides. So we next were interested about in, in the mechanism, so what is the preceding event for the cytotoxicity, and then we, in order to do that, we looked for caspase 3.7 activation to, to record apoptosis, and again, with our test set of seven compounds, we saw no effect of the safe ones, but we saw a very nice um, effect with the toxic ones, and that occurs prior to the cytotoxicity that we see. Um, another important point also mentioned by Richard before is like uh, we have high uptake of oligonucleotides in the non-parenchymal cells, and so far we looked only in the hepatocytes. And we wanted also to address or to put the non-parenchymal cells into the equation and look if there is more damage if we have co-cultures. And uh, this is something we is shown here in the summary. So we compared hepatocyte monocultures with hepatocyte non-parenchymal stem cell co-cultures. And in order to specifically pick up the signal of the hepatocytes, we looked in the supernatants for an hepatocyte-specific marker, which also can be a biomarker that can be translated into the clinic, which is MIR-122. And to our surprise, we didn't see any difference um, in the severity of the hepatocyte damage if we have NPCs uh, present or not. So that was a bit, little bit of a surprise that the NPCs don't exaggerate the effect of oligonucleotides on the hepatocytes. But I think it's also a nice tool to investigate a liver specific or a hepatocyte specific effect in complex co cultures. Um, the other aspect that I mentioned earlier was that was important to us was to look for um, the translatability to humans. So subsequently, finally, we also tested human hepatocytes. So we, we had cryopreserved uh, human hepatocytes. And when we look at our three safe and four toxic uh, oligonucleotides again, we see that we have a good correlation between the uh, mouse data and the human data. There are certainly outliers, like you see here the uh, LNA number or yeah, number 47 that doesn't show up in the, in the human hepatocytes and we did that many, many times with many different batches. So there may be species differences in certain compounds. 
Um, but also important here is we tested two oligonucleotides that had been in the clinic and had shown ALT flares in the clinic in healthy subjects. And we also recapitulated that um, in, in our um, in vitro hepatocyte study. Um, and finally, we looked also for the underlying mechanism in the human uh, cells, and uh, we could confirm that here also the triggering event is caspase 3.7 activation early on. Um, the next important tissue we looked at is the kidney, because that's the organ where highest accumulation is seen. Here we put together a different um, tool set, comprising of five different um, Again, LNA gut mills directed against human PCSK9 gene. And um, we looked into many different cells and finally found the PTEC turret uh, human renal proximal tubular epithelial cell line as the one to work with that pretty much or pretty well reflects uh, this uh, human proximal tubular cells. And uh, again, first we investigated, knocked down to see if after unassisted uptake of oligonucleotides, we see a nice knockdown. And you see that in the, in the blue curve. Um, and the knockdown is much better than one in, in a cell that is not that responsive uh, to oligonucleotides in the, in the purple curve. So these cells are suitable to assess uh, toxicity. And uh, we did a similar experiment. We treated the cells with our um, oligonucleotides and look for cytotoxic signs. And after um, nine days of incubation here, we saw that the ATP reduction in the cells goes along with the toxicity pattern, so we have a very nice uh, correlation. Um, but interesting to note here is that after three days, we don't see anything. And after six days, we also don't see a lot in ATP changes. So we really have to treat that long, but that also reflects pretty much the situation in vivo where the kidney toxicity is coming much later than the hepatotoxicity in, in the tox experiments. However, that was not very satisfying because uh, it's cumbersome and we need a lot of, uh, of, of molecules. And um, so we thought, can we find an earlier marker? Can we find a biomarker that probably pops up after three days or six days? So we went on and looked in the, in the supernatant of our cell culture. Uh, for 42 different biomarkers after different time points. So we looked after three days, six days, and nine days. And uh, among the biomarkers were um, renal injury markers. We had growth factors, and we um, had cytokines. And among all these 42, there was one that uh, very nicely correlated with the in vivo toxicity pattern. And we already saw, and that was the epidermal growth factor, EGF, which already very nicely after six days uh, reflected the in vivo toxicity of the oligonucleotides dose dependently. And again here we said, okay, we have five molecules, again one target. We extended the validation set um, to 19 different um, oligonucleotides. And here again, uh, we were able with this assay, with this EGF readout after six days uh, to recapitulate 17 or predict 17 of the 19 in the correct way uh, compared to the in vivo toxicity. So in summary, um, I think uh, we have established primary hepatocyte and proximal tubular epithelial cells um, as a, uh, to re recapitulate the toxicity that we see in the liver and in the kidney in animal models um, treated with, with antisense oligonucleotide drugs. We had similar classic, simple classical readouts that we can use or embed in our screening strategies. And we reduce the attrition rate um, in in vivo uh, toxicity studies a lot by applying these early assays, um, which also follows the 3R concept. So it's always nice if we don't have to use that many animals. And um, we have also demonstrated that we see toxicity effects in human cells, which is highly relevant, certainly. And uh, further on, we can use these in vitro systems to do mechanistic studies. And to have that summary just in one picture to end with uh, how I start with. Um, so we simply just built in an, an, an filter um, with, uh, for in vitro safety between the in vitro, in vitro efficacy and the in vivo uh, efficacy and safety studies. And I would like to acknowledge all the people. So there was a great collaborative work between uh, my colleagues in the Roche Innovation Center in Basel and in the Roche Innovation Center in Copenhagen. Thank you.